We are, uh, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, except on Long Island, where the shortest distance between two points is very much like going through the corn maze at Schmidt's Farm at night. But fortunately, we, um, we have a panel full of people who have spent countless hours straightening out that line to the degree possible, making it smoother, safer, uh, more strategic, and making sure that it's paid. Um, so we um, will introduce each panelist as they come up, and it's a great cross-section. Uh, the best place to start would be with the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council, uh, on the land of Novales and Impact, uh, who uh, essentially the what they do is they put five county executives, a couple of people from New York City, the MTA, in the same room together and figure out how to spend the money that we won't be getting from Washington now we're now going to South Carolina, Wisconsin, and uh, Missouri. So uh, Jerry Bogatz, who uh, is, you know, has the unenviable task of doing that, is here. So Jerry, if you start us off. I am the one with the power, as Mitch pointed out. So, um, thank you for that intro. I, I understand what you mean by the unenviable position, and I used to have, and this is no personal affront to you, but I used to have hair when I started. <laughs> um, on behalf of um, our Executive Director, Jose Rivera, I like thank Vision Long Island for this opportunity to, uh, to talk about our new uh, regional transportation plan. Also, I'm here with uh, Mary Byrne, who is our new head of our Long Island office. Mary, if you can stand up and state your home phone number. <laughs> uh, Mike Giardina is also here, who is our public information officer. He's brought some materials on the table uh, about NIMTEC, so please, please take those because we have to get rid of the inventory. Um, but also it's information about this this process. And, you know, they asked me to set a tone for the panel uh, by talking about how the sausage is made, basically. And, and the context of this is really important for their discussion because, uh, as Michael stated, uh, federal money does come into the region through this process, assuming it still exists in the next couple of years. And that's an important part of how the member agencies have been to finance transportation improvements. Uh, so you'll hear more about that as we go through. But very quickly, uh, since time is short, um, it's page down, right? I thought so. That's what I thought so. I wasn't maybe doing this without a problem. Space bar. Hey! So, uh, we cover this area. Uh, this is our planning area. Uh, five boroughs in New York City, five suburban counties in Asso and Suffolk here on Long Island. And uh, what is this body called MTIC? It's a metropolitan planning organization. It's essentially a regional council of governments. Uh, it's required by federal regulations. And it's, uh, there are over 400 of these organizations throughout the country that exist in metropolitan regions in order to bring federal dollars into the, uh, the, their regions. And we're responsible, we being our members, are responsible for the mandated planning process that has to be followed in order to be eligible for that, for that funding. So our membership includes, as Michael indicated, five suburban county executives, including an Nassau County Executive, Suffolk County Executive here on Long Island, uh, two New York City agencies, the commissioners of planning and DOT, the New York State Department of Transportation Commissioner, uh, and of course the two large uh, public authorities, the MTA and the Port Authority. The Port Authority is interesting because they are actually an advisory member since they're a self-financed public authority. They don't make uh, a lot of use of federal dollars, but obviously they're very important to what happens in transportation in the region. So they are certainly at the table. Then there are a number of other advisory members. This is NIMTIC though. I'm staffed to NIMTIC, so is Mary, so is Michael. Uh, we're not NIMTIC. This is then that this body is the body that makes this happen. This is where the sausage is made. So uh, the major elements of transportation funding are uh, federal, state, and local. Each come down to project sponsors. Uh, NIMTIC ends up being in this area here where uh, Congress appropriate, authorizes and appropriates. The state uh, distributes by formula. And then the NIMTIC and other MPOs in New York State uh, basically make decisions on how that federal dollars how those federal dollars are going to be used, and then the project sponsor receives the funding. There are 
Uh, there is a pathway that includes discretionary funding that comes down directly from the federal uh, uh, government uh, based on a national competition, but that's not the majority of the funding. And of course, the state and the local uh, sources do often come through the process uh, as at least local match and sometimes overmatch for projects. So although the state and uh, local sources are uh, are separate and apart, they are often combined into. Local does include public authorities like the MTA and the Port Authority. And these are the programs that the federal, um, the current federal act authorizes. There are a number of different types of programs for highways and transit with a lot of flexibility to move back and forth and uh, different objectives for each of these uh, programs. And this is basically where the project sponsors get the funding once we go through our process. So what is that process? Well, um, without going into a lot of detail here, there is a, a full planning process defined in the federal regulations. Starting in the upper right uh, slice there with the regional transportation plan, which is the long range view. Uh, the bottom slice, the transportation improvement program is very important because that's where the projects are actually defined um, that will receive the funding. And then up on the left, uh, you get to the upper left hand slice, which is the reason for doing all this, and that's project planning and implementation. And those projects could be physical roadway projects, bridge projects, they could be transit uh, purchases, transit right of way issues. It's a whole range of different transportation uh, improvements that are, that are eligible in this process. So the regional transportation plan really is the basis for this funding in an empty region, and it really provides a blueprint. The consensus of our member agencies on what's going to be moving forward in terms of federally funded projects. It also represents a shared vision. Our members, each of our members, are doing their own planning for their own um, responsible jurisdictions. Whatever equipment and facilities and services are under their jurisdiction. When they come together as NIMTIC, there's a there's well theoretically anyway a value added because they we interact with each other. That doesn't mean that their planning goes out the window. Not by, by no means. Uh, but there's the value added of bringing their planning to a common table and talking about the region as a whole. Uh, we need to have a new plan every four years because the Fed said we have to. So uh, literally we finish one and we start another. And that's not a bad thing because it's a living document. A lot of new assumptions go into each cycle and so forth. It, it helps the process stay alive. And we do a lot of public involvement to put our plan together, but that's a heavy lift for us, as you can imagine. Uh, we have to have a conversation with over 12 million people in our planning area. Uh, very difficult. Uh, but we do the best we can when we put a new plan together. So the future challenges uh, that the plan really focuses on, uh, first of all, this, these overarching considerations are, are key. Uh, the current transportation system accommodates millions of movements, both in passengers and freight. It's extensive, but it's aging and the planning area is projected to grow in population, employment, and travel by 2045. So therein lies the challenge of the future. A uh, huge system that does a lot, but it's old, it's aging, and yet it's going to have to do more as we move forward. And uh, just operating the system, preserving it, and enhancing it is in itself a challenge because it is so extensive. I'm not going to go through all these details here, but you get the idea that there's a huge, huge transportation system out there that needs to be uh, cared for and fed. And uh, change is going to happen, uh, but the types of change that we're talking about now uh, could transform when, how, and why people are traveling and goods are moving, unlike in, in uh, cycles past. And things like information and communication technology, uh, fuels, these types of <coughs> threshold technologies are emerging, and we don't really have a good handle on what uh, the impact is going to be, even in the long range. But we are uh, projecting regional growth, both in uh, population, employment, and in uh, economic activity, which will create additional freight tonnage. And uh, that will obviously be uh, manifested by growing travel. Uh, daily trips, daily transit trips, daily auto trips, and so forth. Goals going up. I'm not going to go through this in detail given the time constraints. Uh, goods movement is also uh, forecast to significantly uh, increase over the period of the plan. And that's going to affect every county. And uh, the result will be increased congestion. And uh, that certainly is the case here at Nassau and Suffolk County. Uh, also, we have a mega regional travel ship. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we have people moving all throughout a three state area. Uh, most of the travel is within sub areas, but there's a lot of travel between, and that's very important. That's a challenge in and of itself. So, how do we respond to the challenge? Well, Plan 2045 uh, and all the plans that NTP 
agencies it does provide a strategic framework for the member agencies to uh, compile a shared vision. But I want to focus on fiscal constraint and project eligibility because that's really what this panel is about. And I'll end in like two minutes. We, are, we have to forecast uh, how much this is all going to cost in the long term in order to show what the region can potentially pay for and that becomes eligible for federal funding. You see some really big numbers here, billions of year of expenditure dollars. So they're inflated to the year that they're supposed to be expended. Uh, 627 billion for operations and maintenance. That's with the MTA and, and all the other agencies that has comprised MTA. And I'm sorry this graphic slipped down, but that's about 450 billion uh, for system preservation, just for system preservation. And then an additional 33 billion is in the constraint plan for system enhancements. Another 75 billion is speculative, not in the constraint plan, but things we could do uh, with additional funding. And uh, you know, just skip this slide quickly and go to this one. This shows the costs on the right: um, transit preservation being a big, big part, but also uh, the system preservation. And what we expect to get on the left, and we, we can forecast at the upper range of our forecasting uh, uh, ranges uh, for federal and state, we can forecast that we'll come close to covering all these costs in the long term, uh, but not necessarily meet. And uh, at the lower end of the range, that gap is even larger. So our current transportation improvement program, as you can see here, is about $36 billion. The federal share is about 35%, uh, a little bit less. That's a little low at this point, and we're anticipating, and usually the federal share is between 40 and 45 percent. We don't know what uh, the federal policy is going to be going forward in terms of federal investment in transportation nationally. Uh, basically, the current act runs out in fiscal 20, and then Congress has to authorize additional funding after that, so we'll see what happens. State and local share is the majority here, but the federal portion is, in fact, important. And most of that is actually going to transit right now. Uh, almost 75% of it in the current uh, TIP. Uh, that's a five-year program. Uh, that's a little bit exaggerated. It's usually 40-60, 40% uh, highway, 60% transit, but with the large projects that are in our current program, transit is a little bigger than this going around. So that's just to give you a little sense of what we think is coming, how this all filters through the process, what our members do with it once it comes down, and what we're anticipating for the future. So with that, I will stop talking and Turn it over to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. The um, Long Island Railroad, I, mean, I grew up on the Long Island Railroad. <coughs> it was a much simpler time. Sure. And uh, the railroad needed to operate as it did from uh, years ago, from the years ago for, for many, many years. However, it's exciting times now because you're going to have an extra track to take care of. So if you would um, lead off with that, then. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kyle McGraw, and I'm with the Long Island Railroad. I'm director in the Strategic Investments Department. We're sort of the planners for the Long Island Railroad. We oversee the capital program and work on a lot of uh, the new planning uh, initiatives for new investments, new projects that go on. And it's been a very exciting, busy, and rewarding time these past couple of years as we've been able to implement a lot of new projects and update uh, a lot of new things that uh, will help and benefit people across Long Island here. And so one of the greatest things is we've had a lot of support from the governor's office. Uh, he's been instrumental in really advocating for a lot of these new investments and making sure that they get funded as well. And so we're excited by the new uh, LAR modernization program. It really begins in the west. You can see it uh, updating uh, Penn Station and the new Farley train hall that's under construction right now. Uh, there's east side access that's under construction. And we're updating uh, Jamaica Station. And as you go through there, you can see the construction activity, simplifying building a new platform, simplifying the tracks, putting in new signal system. All of this to really help people move east-west through Jamaica. We've just finished the third track project, which a lot of you have probably already heard of, between Floral Park and Hicksville. We're going to add a third track to that two-track segment, which is a real bottleneck now. Uh, as the Port Jefferson line comes into Hicksville, and the Conklin line comes into Hicksville, you've got four tracks that go down to two tracks. And we'll now have three tracks that we can have that express lane for the commuting period in the AM and PM and 
really speed up uh, prob you know, problems and improve reliability for commuters and allow reverse peak travel out on the island. And that's on top of the second track now that's going on between Farmingdale, Farmingdale and Konkuma. And again, more and more investments, new, more benefits to all riders and commuters. So we're really seeing activity all across Long Island and uh, we're very excited for what this potential for the future. And um, the next panelist uh, has won many, many hats on Long Island. Uh, in fact, he's probably more responsible for teaching me how to navigate the governmental <laughs> than anyone. So uh, blame him. Uh, That's okay. Uh, uh, MTA board member Mitch Pally. Mitch, if, uh, again, we're talking about exciting times, things happening with, with the bridges, with the railroads. Oh, yes. With the tunnels. Well, every place has, I mean, I've, I've had the uh, honor of being an MTA board member now for 12 years representing Suffolk County. Uh, the MTA board has 21 members, but it only has 13 votes. We have a significant number of people who do not have a vote. Uh, Suffolk County has one vote, and that's mine. Um, and um, we are in the process of, at the moment, of course, implementing the current five-year MTA capital plan, which is $32 billion for Long Island Railroad, for the city subway and bus system, for Metro North, uh, for bridges and tunnels, um, and starting the process of the next capital plan, uh, the, 19, the 2020 through 2024 plan, uh, which will probably be even more than that. Um, in addition, uh, the funding for a third track, which is a project uh, many of us have worked on for many, many years, uh, will be done as part of an amendment to the capital plans, um, which will actually happen at the MTA board on December 13th, um, we hope, it should, um, in that context. But um, the MTA board obviously distributes uh, funds throughout the entire region on all of the uh, program that we run, uh, obviously keeping it in its current, uh, making sure that it, the maintenance and operations of it is an integral part of that and takes the largest part, as, as uh, Jerry pointed out. And then, of course, we have expansion projects Third track being one of them. We just opened uh, the extension of the 2nd Avenue subway uh, to 96th Street. For those of you who have not taken it, you really should. It's a beautiful extension of the subway. Um, the, a couple of years ago, we extended the number seven line to Hudson Yards on the west side to open up that entire area for development. Um, and if you go to the Hudson Yard station, you will be able to go on the longest escalator in the MTA system. And just don't look down uh, when you do it in that context. Um, obviously, some of the other things that have gone on, uh, for those of you who go over the bridges that are operated by MTA, you no longer have to stop. Uh, they are now all tollless. That means you don't have to stop, you automatically pay the toll. It doesn't mean you don't pay the toll because uh, many people do not realize that 75 cents of every toll dollar paid goes to mass transit it, to subsidize the railroad, subsidize the subway system, subsidize Metro North. So for those going over the bridges, you're not just paying for the maintenance of the bridges, you're paying to subsidize the fares on that everybody else pays in that context. Um, in addition to that, there's a new development, obviously, the Tappan Zee Bridge, which is not MTA related, but um, there are Metro North improvements that actually go under the bridge uh, to uh, for our friends in the um, in the northern suburbs and west of the Hudson. There is a train system that operates west of the Hudson from Rockland County and Orange County that is uh, MTA owned but operated for us uh, by New Jersey Transit. Um, you all see the uh, new subway action plan that is being put into place. Uh, that funding for that will be part of the MTA budget, which will also be discussed and approved, I assume, on December 13th, uh, which fashions a whole new part of uh, improving the subway system. You can see now just about every station has uh, countdown clocks, so you can see how long it is until the next train comes on all various lines and other improvements. Um, 
One other thing that is coming to the Long Island Railroad and to Metro North also, but I'll just talk about the Long Island Railroad is, of course, we're gonna have the new M9 cars. For the, finally, we're gonna get rid of the M3s, uh, send them to the Maryland so they can put them in the Chesapeake Bay, which is where old subway and rail cars go to die, because uh, they use them as reefs there. Um, and we'll have brand new M9 cars with all of the various amenities that our customers today uh, want and, and need uh, for, their, for their trip uh, in that regard. So it's an exciting time at MTA. Um, we get the headaches as well as we get the benefits uh, of it, uh, but you're gonna see, I think in the next couple of years, a lot of progress being made. And I would tell you, um, for those of you who go to Penn Station, and you know, I tell my friends at, at uh, Metro North, you know, one of the benefits of East Side Access, which is being built, of course, 150 feet under Grand Central, so you can't see it, but it is unbelievable, is not only will the Long Island Railroad be able to go to Grand Central, but Metro North will now be able to go to Penn Station because it will open up some slots, and I tell them all the time, I'm much happier to go into Grand Central. I'm not sure how happy you're gonna be about going to Penn Station in its current format. But we do have lots of plans to improve Penn. Farley building is part of that. But today, if you want a secret in Penn Station, go to the West End Concourse and wait for your train there for the Long Island Railroad. It is gorgeous, it is lit, uh, it is open. You can see the trains coming in and out because of the, of the windows. And there's like 12 people there uh, because nobody knows where it is. But if you come in on the 8th Avenue, and just go up the stairs. If you come from 7th Avenue, just walk around through the subway piece. It's a great place to wait for the train because there's nobody there. Uh, not because there's nobody getting on the train, but because everybody else waits under the big board as if the big board gives them the information five minutes before everybody else gets it. We know that's not true, but that's the perception. Uh, but if, as I said, if you really want to have a great place to wait in Penn Station, Try the West End Concourse for Long Island Railroad. Thank you. That that secret is out somewhat. That's okay. Yeah, last week, so people are starting to get it, and so. they're starting it's to there. heed your uh, heed your advice. That's right. The um, probably the most overlooked mode of transportation outside of bicycles, I guess, is the bus system on the island. Uh, vital in many ways, but. Um, yeah, maybe not not utilized quite the way that it should be, nor paid attention to by uh, by a lot of the folks in government the way it, it should. And uh, I know I started riding a bus back when it was Misba. Now it's nice. It's been nice. I wish it was nice when I. <laughs> well, you can ride it again. You can still ride it. Um, you've got a you got a tough job right now, given the. Uh, not just the nuts and bolts of getting people from here to there, but in terms of, of, of certainty about funding, uh, about changes in, in leadership and different ideas coming in, and, and getting you know, really converged on by, by, by every different area, uh, trying to get you to meet their needs on a, with limited resources. So with that, as a preface, let us know how it's, how it's all bright and rosy right I'm going to stand up in a minute, I'll try not to strangle you with this. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Mike. Um, I, I want to talk about, a, I'll call it a tale of disruption as a, as a sort of a convenient way to, to discuss what's going on and what's next. And so my shorthand is 20th century versus 21st century. And I would describe nice bus today as a very fine 20th century bus system. Um, but maybe not what we're looking for in the future. There are a couple of ways that, the, that what's coming is different from what exists today. In the 20th century bus systems were fixed route, fixed schedule primarily. In the 21st century, they're, they're personalized. The service design is becoming personalized. You're, you're all familiar with Uber. Well, that's what's coming in, in transit in general, is that you'll, you'll interact with the system as, as opposed to in the 20th century, you go get a timetable, you stand at the bus stop, and 80% of the time it shows up when the timetable says it does. Um, and that's true of uh, 20th century rail systems too. 
in the 21st century, you'll interact through, uh, through some personal device and you'll design some of the service. There'll be fixed route probably for uh, many, many years to come, but there'll be uh, some more diversity in the way we deliver service. A, a 20th century system is a, is a physical thing. It's a, set, it's a map with a set of routes and bus stops and transit centers, and that's what people from my, uh, my uh, where I began, think of as the system. The system of the 21st century is often described as mobility as a service. It's not an institution, it's probably a network of institutions. And you're a, a mobility consumer, you find an entree into that network of institutions, and you get your mobility needs met by a combination of things. So maybe part of it's on a train, maybe it's on a bus, maybe it's on bike share, maybe it's on car share, uh, maybe it's on an autonomous vehicle that takes, the, takes you the last mile from the train station, any number of those things. But we're, we're in the transition from a uh, system as a physical set of assets to a system as a set of services. In the uh, 20th century, we use fossil fuel. We're partway in the evolution. We use mostly compressed natural gas, but it's still a fossil fuel. It's not diesel, but it's not emission-free either. In the 21st century, it will all be electric. That move is very much underway now. In the 20th century, towards the end, we were uh, compelled to create paratransit systems to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we created these uh, sort of minimally compliant systems that served only a small population who had to go through a, uh, uh, a process to become eligible. In the 21st century, systems will uh, provide paratransit service, demand responsive service, but it won't just be for ADA eligible people. It'll serve their needs, of course, which is very important, but it will serve many other people's needs too. And it's one of the many tools in that mobility as a service, a set of services that can, can help people uh, get where they need to go. Um, in the uh, 20th century, uh, we had one size vehicle, vehicle basically. If you had six people to carry, well, a 40-foot bus was the right tool. And if you had 60 people to carry, well, a 40-foot bus was the right tool. We're in the process now of right-sizing our fleet. Just beginning, but we've got some, a few bigger buses and a few littler buses. And as time goes on, the diversity of the vehicles on which you might uh, meet your mobility needs will change and grow and expand. Uh, and also in the 20th century, we, uh, towards the very end, we learned this term, uh, transit-oriented development. And uh, the, uh, the old guys in the business like me thought that meant, okay, we'll build a bus route and some of our, our rail line and some stops, and, and you'll build stuff around it. And that's the way TOD will work. Well, of course, in the 21st century, we know it's a much more interactive and reiterative process where planning the transportation facility is, is part and parcel of planning the rest of the development, too. Nice Bus today is a very interested observer with a little teeny role in a few, few projects. Uh, when the hub uh, gains some more substance, and starts to develop some, uh, some momentum will be part of planning the transportation part of that, but it won't be an add-on, it will be integral to the way the, to the, the, way the hub is, is planned. Um, the 20th century transit service is labor intensive. Uh, most 66% of our budget are labor costs. The 21st century there will be autonomous vehicles, labor will still be a very important part of it, but there will be a greater diversity in how we operate vehicles. Some with a human driver, some not. Um, so there, there are a number of changes that are underway. Nice bus is, uh, we've got a toe in the water. We'd like to jump, we'd like to be all in, but right now we've got a toe in the water. And you might be saying, well, why is that? The 21st century is well underway, how come you're how come you're not uh, all in? And I, I've got a set of slides, but I'm, I'm not going to take the time to, to load them. To, I, you, you're imaginative people. You can follow along. So the, the first slide I would show, there's four. Well, don't worry. Uh, the first one would be a, uh, a slide that describes total bus ridership in Nassau County. And it would look like going back to about 2005, so spanning both Long Island bus and Nice bus. And what it would look like would be um, the, uh, the kiddie roller coaster at the Parish Festival. Not very fast, not very steep, 
goes up till about 2011 and then it starts back down again. And that, that trend has been fairly steady. So you'd say, well, why is that? So that I, my next slide I put up would be total hours of service. And you'd see that same uh, arrangement of a steady increase till about 2010 and then a steady decrease. A little steeper up, a little steeper going down. Still, uh, still not a scary roller coaster. And you'd say, well, why are you reducing the amount of service? So I put up another slide that shows the total funding for transportation in Nassau County going back to 2005. And now it starts to get a little scarier. It's steeper, it's more uneven, but overall it's up till about 2011 and then back down again. Funding is, is um, it's composed of Fairbox plus state aid, which is the biggest source, plus county aid, plus a, few, a little bit of federal money. So you'd say, well, what's making it so volatile? And I'd show you the really scary roller coaster. There, there's more than one, one effect here, but the really scary roller coaster is Nassau County funding, which goes up and then it dives precipitously in 2011, and then it starts back up again and then dives precipitously again this, this year. Stomach churning, probably not the thing to say just before lunch, but, but truly stomach churning like a, like a real roller coaster. And, and that's the limitation that keeps us from moving into the 21st century in, in a really aggressive and effective way. So I think, to, just to end there here with something that, uh, uh, that, that's a little more optimistic, it, it's time for a reset. It's clearly time for a reset in a lot of ways, in Mediola, in Albany, and a lot of people who get it, and I'm, I'm optimistic and confident that the, the reset button is about to be pushed. Today you've got, uh, what I, uh, as an analogy, you've got a, your bus system is analogous to a very good telephone with a rotary dial on the front of it and a nice cord in the wall. Much better than no phone at all, but probably not what we need to really achieve our full potential as a community in the 21st century. We know where to go. We've got some, uh, some support from elected officials and thought leaders like yourselves, and uh, I'm confident that we're well on our way now. Thanks. WSP Parsons Brinker Hoffman. All right. Let's WSP. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. WSP. Yeah. Back to acronyms without vowels. The uh, sort of the Swiss Army knife, I guess, of, uh, uh, when it comes to infrastructure and transportation. Uh, I mean, you, you, you do it all: design, build, engineering, figuring out how to pay for things. Uh, particularly interested and what you have to say because of that. So, I'm going to be quiet. Okay, uh, I'm Scott Tromer with uh, WSP's uh, U.S. Advisory Services. My, my focus is on developing funding and financing plans for uh, major infrastructure uh, projects. And as we all heard from you know, the panelists, you know, this region has you know, significant needs and uh, uh, for just maintaining uh, the existing system as well as you know uh, thinking about uh, the future um, as Jerry noted earlier in his commentary and as we all know there's a lot of uncertainty about the uh, future of federal funding um, and more so now than it has been in, in the past there's changing priorities in terms of uh, you know, federal funding for uh, public transit investments uh, for expansions, uh, you know, for state of good repair. Uh, but looking back over history, uh, you know, federal funding has gone through other periods of uncertainty. But the noticeable trend has been the federal level of federal participation has been declining nationally. You know, say over the last uh, 15 years has you know declined from about 50 percent to 40 percent. You know, for the NIMTIC region, it's you know a, a bit uh, lower than that. At the same time, you know, there's significant demand uh, for uh, uh, you know transportation to serve new markets and provide uh, service in existing markets. And what have uh, states and regions been doing? What they've uh, 
uh, you know, there's been increasing support at the state and local level. Nationally, there's been a voter referendum to increase sales tax, motor vehicle taxes, uh, other user fees to expand, you know, trans networks in Los Angeles, you know, Denver, and, and in this region as well, there's been, you know, a number of, you know, no, notable increases in, you know, certain uh, user fees uh, and, and, and taxes, you know, most recently the payroll uh, mobility tax for, for the MTA region. And so the expectation is, uh, while there will be some level of federal support going in into the future, ultimately uh, regions will have to rely upon, increasingly upon themselves to provide the necessary resources uh, to do that. Uh, within the New York region, clearly we understand this is a high tax region. You know, Long Island has some of the highest you know, property taxes, if not the highest property taxes in the nation. So that you know, does pose a challenge. You know, proposed changes in federal tax reform may make that a bit you know, difficult in terms of you know, individual deductibility for state and local uh, uh, taxes. Uh, so, but nevertheless, we still need to find you know, those solutions uh, at, at the state and local level to move forward with uh, infrastructure investments. Some of the ideas you know, being put forth you know, recently in RPA's regional plan is you know, increased use of tolling. Uh, for uh, for transportation projects to improve both highway and, and, and subsidized uh, you know transit initiatives uh, use of uh, value capture and uh, joint development and uh, for you know projects you know such as you know NASA hub or, or you know for example you know may be considered for uh, 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 Nichols Road. Uh, at the same time, while we're looking at uh, improvements in or new funding sources to maintain and improve uh, our existing networks, we also have to look at how we deliver uh, transportation. Uh, you know, costs for major infrastructure projects are you know, skyrocketing, and so we have to think about what's, you know, how can we streamline the environmental processes and planning processes that we go through. How can we uh, improve you know, the design and construction of, the, uh, uh, of these programs through looking at uh, public-private partnerships where we can uh, help uh, you know, push some of the risk or share some of the risk with the private sector in return giving them you know, reward for delivering it, uh, to delivering projects in a more timely and uh, cost-effective you know, manner uh, possible. And this region has started uh, doing, uh, looking at uh, P3 approaches and executed them on certain bridge projects for, you know, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, for Gothels, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and for uh, Bayonne as, as well, and, you know, the expanded use of that, plus, you know, uh, new funding, you know, can help, you know, start to, you know, close, you know, the funding gap. I, uh, I look at my watch and I see that we obviously have absolute pros on this panel because we have time for Q&A. Uh, why don't I, uh, as you formulate your questions, why don't I try to kick it off? Because Mike Setzer, you came up with uh, two concepts, uh, adaptability and reset. And given uh, the railroads have fixed tracks, mm -hmm. uh, the roads are pretty much Constant. If, if you and, and, and Jerry, this might be you know, too, talk about the, the type of coordination uh, that is being done and that can be done to ensure that we are able to adapt our transportation system, all the aspects of it, to be able to, to, to meet uh, emerging needs, uh, particularly from an economic development standpoint with uh, uh, with new employment centers and things like that. Uh, give us a, a sort of statement on that. Okay, um, yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, I, I would start out by, uh, by saying that, uh, this, this might sound like a plug, uh, that as a private company, we're, we're, I actually work for a company named TransDev, and several of my colleagues are here. We're Nassau County's partner, and as a private company, we have the ability to import 
methods and techniques and technology from literally all over the world. And that's part of part of what we bring to the county. The, the county's our fun, is a, the policy partner. Uh, they set the set the fares and set the budget and that kind of thing. And and uh, so I think there's a there's a potential there for us to to contribute a lot. But the big picture is the mobility as a service is that institutions, organizations don't define this. Your your transportation needs as a commuter are not limited to a particular uh, organization's footprint or a particular mode. You want to get from here to there, and it may take several several institutions and several modes. So <clears throat> part of the reset, to get back to your question, part of the reset is a reset in thinking. It's not it's not all money. I mean, money's important, but it's it's also a reset in thinking and a reset in organization. And I th I think we're at the very early stages of that now. We're we're just thinking about thinking about it uh, to, to put a claim in there. But a more regional approach uh, where all the uh, all the operators and all the uh, planners are uh, are thinking about mobility as a service instead of about institutional interests. That's the first step, and we're there now. I think, Jerry. Let me think about what you just. Um, so I think the adaptability is important to consider that our region is not very regional in, in, in many ways. Uh, uh, there's not a regional culture here as there are in some other regions. But at least with processes like this, like the one I described, a table is offered where all the agencies come together. And we're talking about very big entities. I mean, the MTA is probably the largest public authority in the world, and the Port Authority is probably right behind it in terms of what you have to plan for, what you have to, uh, what the size of your jurisdiction, and what you're responsible for. Um, so they have a very healthy planning process, as do the counties and the city and the state. And when they come together, I think the value added is the additional coordination. Okay, it doesn't happen by osmosis, and they don't necessarily need to coordinate, but it helps. It helps that this process exists. The other part I wanted to point out in terms of development is that, and it's something I didn't go into because of time constraints, um, working with the counties and the city, we've identified um, sort of a land use future, uh, which is not, um, it's advisory, uh, using the county's master planning and the city's master planning where we're trying to fit transportation ideas and investments into that land use framework. So I think that that's where there's reaction, and not only reaction, but also planning for additional development and economic development. And it's, again, the members that are doing this, they're coming together to do that on a regional basis, which is uh, pretty unique in our own way of planning. Do you have any uh, questions or so, as a person who lives on Long Island, I realize, and actually on the South Shore, we have a really good branch in Babylon Branch, which often is not acknowledged. But the difficulty for most people is going north south. Um, and what are you currently looking at as possibilities for those north south routes? And a bus works, but is there something else that might work that maybe we should be considering as well? Um, on Long Island, the only alternative to that is bicycling. Um, the likelihood, the likelihood that any opportunities are going to be provided to build north-south, either light rail or hard rail or anything like that is, um, I never use the word none, but it's pretty close. Um, people don't want to give up their right-of-way, people have to give up houses. Uh, people would have to give up all, all sort of things to make that happen. The best opportunity is the bus system, and that's why um, I know in Nassau and in Suffolk, uh, they try to coordinate the operation of the railroad with the operation of the bus system, so that the buses can take you to the train, whether the Babylon branch or whatever branch it happens to be, and then uh, have your route continue in that regard. But um, unfortunately, and it is unfortunate uh, when the, our forefathers and foremothers uh, determined how the Long Island Railroad was going to operate. You know, back in the 1850s, it was basically a New York City to Long Island or Long Island to New York City set of routes. Um, that has not changed in the last 100 and 
75 years, and um, I don't see the likelihood happening. That's why, you know, a perfect example of that, is, as Mike said, is Nichols Road or the Route 110 corridor. Uh, the programs that Suffolk County is trying to implement, those are all bus related because the roadway is already there, and their hope is to be able to use an express bus. Uh, I know that's some places a contradiction in terms, but uh, to, to make the bus either give it its own lane or give it traffic light access so they can train some traffic lights so it can it can be driven at a time and a uh, route that is beneficial to people so that they don't have to, so that the bus is not stuck behind the car. I mean, you know, one of the things that happens if, if I have to be on a bus and I have to be in my own car and they're going the same speed, I'm taking my car. The bus is there to hopefully get there, you're there quicker. So I think that's going to be the end result of North South. Hopefully the 110 and Nichols Road programs will work and then they can be expanded to other places. Uh, but that's really going to be the north-south opportunities here. Unless somebody wants to... Let me, let me just uh, add a little bit to, to what Mitch said. I, I agree completely with, uh, with his assessment. One of the ironies is that um, the, the dominant demand for bus service in Nassau County is also east-west. And so as we are dealing in this, uh, this fixed resource world, the north-south services that we'd like to offer are the very ones that we have been eliminated as we've been reducing uh, reducing service over the years to stay within our budget. And so the irony is that uh, even even the bus system isn't currently doing a very good job with the north south the north south needs. To be optimistic again, though, some of these really lightweight um, modes of travel using a smaller vehicle, using a, a personalized service. They can be north-south if that's where the demand is. And I think we, we've got some products like that that we're going to begin to roll out next year um, after we talk with our, with our county uh, partners. Um, so maybe we'll begin to show some ways that we can, we can provide that kind of service. But, but unfortunately, the, the history has been just like with, uh, with the railway, it's been uh, the, the north-south demand over, I mean, the east-west demand overwhelms the north-south. One more word on that. Uh, if I had time to show, sorry, Mitch. Uh, if I had time to show my maps, you would have seen that both the Nichols Road uh, project and the 110 project are in the regional plan. They're eligible for federal funding, although that might not be their predominant funding going forward. And there, you know, as, as Mitch pointed out, it, it's a concept called bus rapid transit, which is a bit overstated, but the idea is to expedite the service. So to go back to Mike's point about changing the model, um, this is being used extensively now in New York City, uh, in the Hudson Valley, less so, but also, and now on Long Island, and, and both the Nassau Hub transit improvements and the north-south in um, Nichols and 110 are using that concept to try to create something between regular bus service and light rail or heavy rail. And, uh, you know, th there's a lot of potential there uh, for that to work in the future. Yes, yeah, Scott, um, is there opportunity for, uh, I mean, is this fertile territory for P3 or even a commercial venture north-south in some of the areas that, that don't rise to the level of, of a bus system, but yet, uh, Perhaps there's enough of a potential profit for a commercial user. Sure, I mean, I, th I think the opportunity there is again with uh, some of the ride sharing uh, services, you know, it and and you know, NICE's ability, you know, to coordinate and and to uh, uh, you know, jointly develop you know, uh, those services. So you know, within New York City, for example, you know, VIA has, you know, had a very, you know, successful, you know, development and expansion of its, you know, shared ride uh, uh, services uh, for, where, you know, customers ride for a flat fee, you know, through Manhattan or, you know, an additional fee for inner, in, inner uh, a borough service between Manhattan and, and Brooklyn. And again, that's an on-demand uh, uh, service that, you know, could, uh, proved to be, you know, uh, commercially uh, viable uh, in, you know, for uh, a north-south service. Yeah, one day we'll have a Route 112 Jeep. Right, exactly. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. You're going, 
I mean, you're going you're going back to sort of you know the origins of you know transit, where you know you know the jitney services were you know the first uh, you know first forms of transportation. Steve, uh, two parts of the question. One is specifically to an area of uh, Brentwood, Central Island. Uh, the trains are at ground uh, crossings, and there's a lot of part of the problem that community besides men is uh, every time those gates go down, so they rush out, it just totally stops all the people that are out right now. Any plans of ever raising the tracks, say, at Fifth Avenue crossing, for one example? And the second part of the question, doing all this traffic, is how has uh, improvements happened over the years? Of, is more cargo being brought in and out by trains? And uh, is there a growth plan? Right? <laughs> okay, and I, I came here late, so maybe you already went over that. I'm sorry. You want to answer that one first? Or? Sure. So there's a disconnect. Uh, the answer is yes on the, on the freight issue in terms of more moving by rail, certain types of commodities and dads, goods and dads. Um, the issue is a regional one because of connectivity to the uh, national rail network, which uh, there is none. I mean, you have to float cars across the harbor or take trains up to Selkirk, south of Albany, and bring them back down the other side and move them across the, the, the river, basically. Uh, there is a major uh, effort that's identified in the plan to look at, it's been going on for probably two decades now, to look at uh, a rail tunnel for freight underneath the harbor. That is advancing slowly. Uh, it's into its second uh, environmental impact phase. Uh, and it may in fact happen, but um, that's a key issue, limiting the ability uh, to really expand uh, rail freight movement on Long Island. So still, the major freight facility on Long Island is called the Long Island Expressway. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, we have how many grade crossings? 300 and something, 100. Uh, we have more grade crossings in our jurisdiction than all many other railroads combined uh, because of the density of the population, because of the road work and, and whatever. Um, unfortunately, Grade crossing elimination projects are few and far between. All the federal money has dried up. Um, you know, we've talked about, you know, at MTA, if, and that's an appropriate if, there is a major federal infrastructure program of getting some of those funds for grade crossing elimination projects, both on Long Island and in the Hudson Valley, because we know, number one, how important they are in certain communities, but number two, also how expensive they are in, in that context. So um, I think we're all hopeful that there will be a federal program in that and that there would be uh, some funny, you know, we got this year at MTA $10 million for grade crossing eliminations. The entire program to the country was 30 million bucks. Now you can't do, for $30 million, you can't do the Fifth Avenue by itself, okay? So we used the $10 million we got for improvements at various places, but it obviously did not pay for an, a complete grade crossing elimination because those are significantly higher. I, I'm, we're hopeful the federal government will get back into the program of grade crossing eliminations, and I can assure you, if they do, MTA and the railroad, and not just Long Island, but Metro North, will be very, very aggressive in trying to make that happen. Uh, Bruce Miller, I'm a trustee for Ward Jefferson. Uh, there was originally discussion by Suffolk County wanted to make uh, transportation uh, run from Patchogue to Stony Brook. And then I believe it got stretched out to a compromise to study work. I'm not sure I'm very foggy on this. I'm just, very kind of and I'm just wondering if it would make any sense to, to have a loop that went from Patchogue to Fort Jefferson to Fort Jefferson and then Fort Jefferson is a potential major transportation hub, but everything is fragmented. Nobody talks about it. Nobody can find it. A transportation consultant to help sort some of this stuff out. Oh, I'm not sure if Regina is in the room. Oh, there she is in the back. Talk to Regina from Suffolk County. Um, I, you know, that program is a complete express bus service. So that's as simple as making a right turn on 25A and going to Port Jeff. 
um, you know, that's all that encompasses. I, you know, the county executive plan obviously is connecting the various employment centers at the university with the new hub at Ron Conkerman, the train station, um, and the, and the uh, entertainment areas in Patchogue. It also goes to Brookhaven National Lab. So there's no reason it can't extend to Port Jeff. It's just a matter of, you know, the county doing that. So, as I said, I would talk to Regina uh, and from there, from the Economic Development Department at, at the county, and, and hopefully you can work something out in that regard. Jerry, we have a new county executive coming in next. Be nice. The uh, the dynamic of having the five different counties. New York City, and then of course the the MPA. How? Can you give some insight on how that process works? How they how they hash it out? Sure. There's a lot of enlightened self-interest. What, what's helped a lot is that, and, and we're in an interesting phase here of, uh, as Mitch described, some really big transportation projects, infrastructure projects moving forward, expansion and so forth, not only in New York City, but in the region as a whole. Um, mainly transit, but not only transit. Um, each of the, of, of the county executives over the last decade or so uh, whoever they might be, have realized that the only way to get uh, resources into the region for some of these projects, which they've really made uh, centerpieces of their administrations, is to cooperate with each other. Um, because they, you know, we've been educating about the process, that's part of what we do, um, and they've seen the light in that. So their self-interest is what they want to do, but they realize that they have to work regionally to be able to do that. I don't want to I'm not trying to, to suggest they don't have a regional view also, uh, because that comes with the discussion. Um, but I think it's really been driven by the fact that uh, each county executive, each jurisdiction has had ambitious things they wanted to try to accomplish, uh, bringing together transportation and land use in many cases in their counties, in their suburban counties, and that's been a real impetus to bring them closer together also. I can't describe the language that's used in the room, but um, it, it, it's collegial, and, and they understand that they, you know, we're a consensual organization, by the way. All the decisions of intake are made by consensus of affected parties, so no one gets outvoted. Everyone has to come to the same conclusion, uh, which is appropriate because we're not a level of government. It's a regional planning council. Um, so, you know, they need each other. They need to work with each other to be able to reach that consensus, and that's, that's actually been pretty powerful in many cases. Uh, do we have any? Yes. Uh, obviously, uh, lots of big projects. You know, talk about nice. There's plenty to do with the MTA. Uh, and, and music, of course, is the biggest idea um, or the biggest plan. In terms of new sources of funding that might exist in, let's say, the next decade, um, do any of you have any? Well, congestion pricing is obviously going to be the focal point, you know, it's the focal point of the governor at the moment. He's created a commission to look at the issue, um, not only what it is, how it gets implemented, but even more importantly than that, who gets the money after it is implemented, if it is implemented, and how much does the railroad get, how much does the subway system get. Um, so that's going to be the most immediate short-term aspect, I think, of the discussion going on and the discussion that's going on now and will continue in Albany, uh, you know, into, into um, 2018 because obviously it's not just us, it's the local bus systems. NICE would like to have some money. I know Suffolk County Transit would like to have some money uh, to do things that they otherwise can't do. So congestion pricing is probably going to be the most immediate issue. I think going beyond that, many other mass transit systems in the world get what we call real estate benefit money, which is when the value of um, the surrounding community values, their real property values go up as a result of a transit improvement which is made, they help pay for that improvement, either proactively or reimburse the entity, the agency for that money. A perfect example of that is 
um, the expansion of the Second Avenue subway. Um, that has significantly increased the values along Second Avenue in New York City between 63rd and 96th Street, and you know after the next capital plan, it'll be 125th Street. Those significant value increases, none of that money comes to the MTA. It all stays with the city of New York. So there are many communities around the world, as I'm sure our friend knows, where that happens. And yet, uh, in Tokyo it happens, and many other places, that's how they fund the improvements. Um, and so I think that will also be a focal point of um, what's going to happen in the next couple of, in the next five to ten years. And I think, but I think a lot of that, all of that is corollary to, is there going to be a federal bill? And what's the federal bill going to look like? And how much is it going to be? And then after they figure out how much it's going to be, how much is New York going to get? And, and those are different questions. But I think that's going to be the focal point of the discussion going forward. And then the other aspects of that will be part of that discussion. And just to add to that, um, I was giving you a bit of a summary of we have to do a whole financial planning exercise. And that really establishes eligibility for federal funding, that we have to show that we can, in the long term, in the planning sense, uh, pay for and operate what we think we want to do as a region. And when I say we, I mean our members. Um, as part of that exercise, I showed you that we weren't able to identify uh, the complete amount of funds that would be needed, but we have a whole section in the financial plan that talks about alternative uh, funding mechanisms. You mentioned two of them. Um, and you know our members have come to consensus on what types of alternative funding sources uh, they might pursue going forward, given questions like the federal participation as they get answered. So there is some thought uh, amongst our members uh, of what would we do to fill these gaps that are both uh, potential and, and maybe existing now. And uh, I agree that congestion pricing is, is front and center right now, but we're talking about down the road also. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with you know both points that uh, you know, Jerry and Mitch had uh, raised. Um, you know, out, outside of uh, New York, sort of an extreme, you know, case of where uh, a transit system uh, leverages, you know, the value of uh, land is in Hong Kong. The uh, MTR, uh, MTR system is, you know, a profitable, uh, publicly listed uh, transit system, and it um, it makes its money not necessarily from riders, but its uh, ability to uh, develop land that is uh, granted to it by the Hong Kong government in order to uh, uh, leverage that asset and finance new uh, transit lines. You know, in, in the U.S., obviously, that, that doesn't happen. It's not allowed by federal transit uh, uh, law, and uh, it's kind of frowned upon by uh, you know a local you know state and local governments but there is you know clearly an opportunity for increased uh, uh, increased uh, use of uh, value capture techniques to uh, fund uh, transit you know MTA successfully did that with uh, the uh, you know seven line uh, extension you know through the uh, 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 you know ground leases it has uh, with you know developers that helped to you know leverage a billion dollars in, in, in uh, funding capacity that went to the capital program and you know the expectation as you know, Mitch pointed out is there's you know, m you know maybe other opportunities for you know MTA and other transportation providers in the region to you know leverage uh, their assets to provide supplemental funding for uh, their transportation programs. Clearly, again, tolling uh, you know represents another opportunity, whether congestion pricing or expansion of uh, uh, tolling you know uh, uh, through the region, and then obvious consideration still you know needs to be put out for looking at um, uh, increases in existing uh, you know tax sources uh, to, that you know underpin you know most transportation funding in the region. Uh, Mike, we took a
service, one of the aspects of that is a common fare structure. So my question is, with the MTA looking at new payment system, what's NASA's plans of integrating into that? That's central part right now, anyway, with the subways, you get some unique tickets along the railroad. Has that changed? Uh, what thought do you have just to at least keep what we have? Yeah, good question. I, I think we'll follow, at, at, at NICE, we'll follow immediately behind, we'll adopt the same uh, fair payment system that the MTA adopts. Because half of our customers are, we share with the MTA. We're taking people to 30 some rail, um, railroad stations and uh, a lot of customers into Queens, to Jamaica, Flushing, and Rockaway, to subway stations. So we're, we're serving the same group of people and we have to have a unified fair system there. It would be nice if we had it even more broadly, if we had it with Suffolk County also. Um, there's, a, there's no reason that we, we wouldn't, except that it takes some, uh, some consensus at the elected official level, and maybe that will be coming soon. Now, would the new payment system provide a possible basis to make it easier as you look at your mobility as a service vision to integrate bike share and share like being that it's not as right yeah that yeah exactly the the new system will be um, will be software essentially rather than, than machines uh, currently the uh, mag stripe isn't really very flexible um, bike share stands don't take the metro card but it's a relatively when it's all software it's a relatively uh, easier thing for any provider of transportation to to plug into the fair payment system. And I, I do hope that happens. That would make a lot of sense. The, the new system is going to give all of us an opportunity to be more flexible, uh, be more efficient, and also be more fair. Fair. Depending upon your point of view. Uh, because of course, you know, we get requests all the time an MTA that, you know, I should not pay the full fare. Now, we all understand nobody pays the full fare, but even the fare portion I pay, I shouldn't pay that much. Whether it's uh, veterans, students, people with limited incomes, you know, there's all of those type of issues, and, and, and there's no question that they are all well warranted and well deserved. The question is going to be, number one, how do you do it? Because if you reduce somebody's fare, somebody else's has to go up. Uh, because you still need the same amount of money. And so the question, you know, in transit, there's one word. And that word is subsidy. Who pays what for whom? You know, when you go over the Frog's Neck Bridge, the motorist is paying for the mass transit operator. When you use your cell phone, you're paying for the Long Island Railroad rider because they get some. Of, we get some of that money for that. There's all of these different subsidy issues that are involved that are set by the state legislature and the governor. And these questions are now going to have to be faced by them as we move forward. But the new fair payment system gives us an opportunity collectively to do a lot of things we could never do before because. As Mike said, before you had a machine, and, you know, machines break down and they're not very flexible. Now we'll have a lot more flexibility to do a lot more different things. But what that does is make all of those decisions very political in nature. As we conclude, uh, I see out in the audience. I just want to acknowledge them. there's there's somebody out there who's probably forgotten more about transportation infrastructure uh, than some of us will ever learn. Frank Pearson, who's one of the superstars at the uh, Department of Transportation and now is working for a living. But I just want to thank <laughs> uh, And I'd like to thank our panelists, Gary Bogat from NIMTEC, Kyle McGraw from Long Island Railroad, Mitch Pally from the NPA, Mike Setzer from the Nice Bus, and Scott Cromer from WSP. Uh, a wealth of information from you guys in a very short period of time, so we really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming, and uh, enjoy lunch. Thank you.